should glory in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, in whom is our salvation, life and resurrection, by whom we are saved and Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Peace be with you. Dear friends, on this holy night, we give thanks and praise to God for the precious gift of Eucharist, instituted at the Last Supper. Thomas Aquinas called the Eucharist the bread of angels. Pope John Paul, inestimabile donum, the church's most priceless treasure. The fathers of the council, the source and summit of the life of the church. That we might prepare ourselves to celebrate these mysteries and to receive our Lord in Eucharist, we humbly call to mind our sins. Lord Jesus, you are the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ Jesus, You are the high priest who ministers to us at the altar of God. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord Jesus, you nourish us with your body and blood. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, on earth peace, to people of goodwill. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you, we give you thanks for your Lord God, Heavenly King, 
Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, on earth peace, to people of goodwill. Lord Jesus Christ, only begotten Son, Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. You take away the sins of the world, receive our prayer. You are seated. Let us pray. O oh God, who have called us to participate in this most sacred supper, in which your only begotten Son, when about to hand himself over to death, entrusted to the church a sacrifice new for all eternity, the banquet of his love, grant we pray. We may draw from so great a mystery the fullness of charity and of life. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. A reading from the book of Exodus. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this month shall stand at the head of your calendar. You shall reckon it the first month of the year. Tell the whole community of Israel on the 10th of this month, every one of you and your families must procure for itself a lamb, one apiece for its household. If the family is too small for a whole lamb, it shall join the nearest household in procuring one and shall share in the lamb in proportion to the number of persons who partake of it. The lamb must be a year old and without blemish. You shall take it from either the ship or the goats. You shall keep it until the 14th day of this month. And then, with the whole assembly of Israel present, it shall be slaughtered during the evening twilight. They shall take some of its blood and apply it to the two doorposts and the lintel of every house in which they partake of the lamb. That same night they shall eat its roasted flesh with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. This is how you are going to eat it, with your loins girt, sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. You shall eat 
like those who are in flight. It is the Passover of the Lord. For on the same night, I will go on through Egypt, striking down every firstborn of the land, both man and beast, and executing judgment on all the gods of Egypt, I, the Lord. But the blood will mark the houses where you are. Seeing the blood, I will pass over you. Thus, when I strike the land of Egypt, no destructive blow will come upon you. This day will be a memorial feast for you, which all your generations shall celebrate with pilgrimage to the Lord as a perpetual institution. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Blessing cup is a communion with the blood of Christ. Our blessing cup is a communion with the blood of Christ. How can I repay the Lord for all? His goodness to me, the cup of salvation I will raise, I will call on the Lord's name. Our blessing cup is a communion with the blood of in the eyes of the Lord is the death of his faithful your servant am I the son of your handmaid you have loosened my bonds our blessing cup is a communion with the blood of Thanksgiving sacrifice I make. I will call on the name of the Lord. My vows to the Lord I will fulfill before all his people. Our blessing cup is a communion with the blood of Christ. A reading from the first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Brothers and sisters, I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was handed over, took bread, and after he had given thanks, broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it 
in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the death of the Lord until he comes. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. to you, Word of God, Lord Jesus Christ, glory to you, Word of God, Lord Jesus Christ, glory to you. commandment says the Lord love one another as I have loved you glory to you word of God Lord Jesus Christ glory to you word of God Lord Jesus Christ the Lord be with you and with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. Before the feast of Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to pass from this world to the Father. He loved his own in the world, and he loved them to the end. The devil had already induced Judas, son of Simon of Iscariot, to hand him over. So during the supper, fully aware that the Father had put everything into his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God, he rose from supper and took off, took off his outer garments. He took a towel and tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and dry them with the towel around his waist. He came to Simon Peter who said to him, Master, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing, you do not understand now, but you will understand later. Peter said to him, You will never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, Unless I wash you, you will have no inheritance with me. Simon Peter said to him, Master, and not only my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus said to him, Whoever has bathed has no need except to have, to have his feet washed, for he is clean all over. So you are clean, but not all. For he knew who will betray him. For this reason he said, Not all of you are clean. So when he had washed their feet, and put his garments back on and reclined the table again, he said to them, Do you realize what I have done for you? You call me teacher and master, and rightly so, for indeed I am. If I, therefore, the master and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash one another's feet. I have given you a model to follow, so that as I have done for you, you should also do the gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord Jesus Christ.
The Passover story in Exodus 12 is a story of a new beginning. But the thing about new beginnings is they usually mean we have to leave where we are in order to embrace that newness. And sometimes that might be easy, but most of the time as human beings, we don't like to change. We have a great deal of difficulty letting go even if where we were was not a great place. Passover is the pivotal point in the liberation of God's people. Rabbi Alexander Schindler wrote about how this is shaped when he talked about the Mitzrayim. Mitzrayim was the Hebrew name for Egypt. And it literally means the narrow place or the narrow straits. In Passover, God leads us out of the narrow places. And when God takes us out of the Mitzrayim, God extracted us from the places of constricted opportunities, of tight control, of narrow mindedness, where movement was severely limited. The Passover liturgy instructs us to say in the first person, a wandering Aramean was my ancestor because the story of Exodus, as God leads us from the narrow place, goes back to Abraham, our wandering spiritual ancestor. When humanity sees the gods as beings thirsty for human blood, as we might be at our worst, when parents are poised to sacrifice their daughters and sons to appease the world's power, God's voice speaks as it did to Abraham when he loomed over his bound son Isaac and God says, stop, that's enough. God goes with us to that dark and narrow place and leads us to a wider place a wider vision. But of course, we remember it took Israel 40 years to get there. So we know the journey is not always short. Of course, there are other beginnings in the Bible, but this chapter stands out as the place where God tells Moses and Aaron that the event and circumstances that they're about to go through will be remembered for generations to come as a perpetual beginning celebrated every year in ritual and in story. The power of telling a story, especially a story of beginnings, can bind people together with a sense of identity, self-determination, and purpose, all in community. In the Bible, Pharaoh is the first person to shape their ethnic narrative by calling the Israelites a people distinct from the Egyptians, inherently threatening, deserving of severe oppression, including slavery and genocide. In contrast to Pharaoh's narrative of what makes an Israelite, readers arrive at a new beginning story in Exodus 12, which we heard tonight. Here, God calls forward a different story to distinguish these people, or as God calls them for the first time, the whole community of Israel. That's the first time in the scriptures they're referred to that way, the community of Israel, whose identity will be shaped by their relationship with God. And every year from this time onward, we begin with the memory of that moment when that relationship was inaugurated by God, liberating them from slavery. In their ancient context, the power of telling and retelling the story was a way for the Israelites to differentiate themselves from their close neighbors in Egypt. People in groups tend to establish their ethnic identity by contrast to those who are physically the closest to them in other regards. The Israelites lived just north of this African kingdom of Mitzrayim, 
and their cultural memory includes Egyptian names like Moses, Aaron, Phineas, and Egyptian practices like circumcision. But the impact of recounting this story goes far beyond its utility for ancient people drawing a line between us and them. The story of God creating freedom for the Israelites has been inspirational for people across time. In the Hebrew Bible itself, writers continually hearken back to God's liberating work in Exodus as admonition against unfaithfulness or a reason for confidence that God will save them again. Over millennia, our Jewish siblings have celebrated the Passover Seder as both stable root in which to ground their sense of identity and also a malleable ceremony with the potential to speak to diverse experiences of the entire Jewish diaspora. The Jewish writers of our synoptic gospel narratives write the Last Supper as a Passover meal with a new liturgy that expresses the significance of Jesus' death. And oppressed people of diverse backgrounds continue to affirm that this story speaks to God's character as a liberator. And what's interesting, I think, especially in John's gospel, though we don't always realize it on Holy Thursday, is the context of Jesus' foot washing. We heard at the very beginning, if you listen carefully, about Judas's betrayal. It's set up in the text before foot washing. But what comes right after this passage in John's Gospel, after foot washing and Jesus' teaching about it, comes Peter's denial. That act of foot washing is sandwiched between betrayal and denial. Talk about narrow places. But in it, Jesus enacts what love looks like, even in those worst of circumstances. We can all recognize narrow places especially after this last year we've lived. The fact that last year at this time, this church was closed and we couldn't celebrate Holy Thursday with an assembly. Last year on April 1st, I walked from here down to the MGM Grand and back. And on the course of my walk, I saw a total of 12 people a few security guards by the barricaded entrances to the mega resorts, a couple of runners, one person on a bicycle in the middle of the deserted street, and a few Metro police officers. That was it. And while today we're not yet at the promised land, we're surely a lot closer We've been led down a long way out of our narrow straits of a year ago. And yet around the world, in Paris and Prague, in Ontario and Brazil, many places are feeling things getting narrower again. What both the Gospel and the Exodus story also teach is that going through these narrow places not only requires God to lead us, but it requires a community because it is too hard to do it alone. I was thinking a lot this week about 1970 in Forsyth, Montana. We had moved there from Dickinson, North Dakota early in the fall of 1969. And while we were all still getting our bearings, my parents had begun to make friends. It was not uncommon for me to find a couple of my mother's friends with her at the kitchen table, drinking coffee and swapping stories about whatever was going on in our town of 1500. 
But one morning in the early summer of 1970, I came up from my basement bedroom to the kitchen, and as my mother heard me on the steps, she shouted down, we have company, which was her way of saying, you better be presentable since you're just getting out of bed. As I turned the corner to walk into the kitchen, I saw two faces I knew, but I'd never seen at our table before. They were Joe and Alice Phillips. They lived across the alley from us, and they looked really sad and upset. It wasn't long before I found out that Joe and Alice, who ran the local Tasty Freeze, had had a catastrophic fire at the restaurant the night before. And they were sitting over coffee and sweet rolls with my mom and dad, commiserating and trying to figure out what to do next. My father worked for Montana Dakota Utilities Company, so he would always get the calls when there were fires and the power needed to be shut off. That's what tipped him off, that Joe and Alice might need some company. And so, in their normal way, my parents volunteered me and my sister to go to the restaurant with Joe and my dad to see what could be rescued in the debris. It was a very strange place to be, in the middle of a place that had almost burned down from a grease fire. But Joe was determined to salvage whatever he could, and he needed our help to do it. So I was sent into the walk-in freezer, which on a Montana summer day wouldn't have been such a bad thing, except that there hadn't been power there in several hours, so that freezer was no longer very cold. And I was told to just pull out everything I could that seemed like it wasn't completely thawed and put it in one of the coolers in Joe's truck or my dad's station wagon. We did that trudging through the water and the ash for, well, dramatic effect (laughs) for some time. And... In the midst of that, I started to get a little antsy. I was just in seventh grade, or just finished seventh grade, and went up to my dad and said, how long are we gonna be here? And my dad said, we're gonna be here as long as our neighbors need us to be here. That was their way of bringing a sense of community around a tragedy. It was one of those moments that I think of every once in a while at strange times when I see a corn dog, as they used to serve those at the Tasty Freeze. I don't eat them, but if I see them in the frozen food section at the store, I still think about Joe and Alice and about how awful that day must have been for them. As time went on, they moved through their narrow place and with insurance money rebuilt, but it was never the same. About a year later, after the restaurant had reopened, they sold it and said they just had to leave town because it was too sad to drive down Main Street and remember what had happened. Whether it's someone like Joe and Alice, or someone we know who suffered the death of someone they love, whether it's here in our community or halfway around the world, tonight calls us to remember that call to be with, to accompany, and to show up even when we don't know exactly what to say or do because God's liberating love is enacted in community. And so tonight, as we remember and celebrate, we join with all manner of other people in the Mitzrayim of their lives. In the Xinjiang province of China, 
where the Uyghur people are being killed, and the hospice down the street where a family starts to cope with the reality that the end is beginning for their mother. At the border, where unaccompanied children are afraid. In jail, where the man with untreated mental illness sits like inventory in a warehouse. Where someone is feeling lonely and afraid and judged in a room full of their Christian brothers and sisters where someone's being told by their spouse that they do not love them anymore. Where someone is in the confusion and pain of not knowing how to forgive someone or how to communicate with someone even though it's killing them not to. Where someone finds out suddenly, tragically, there's been a death where Christians are kidnapped in Nigeria and killed. And the list goes on. These narrow places in our lives and in our world are precisely why we gather, precisely why we listen to these ancient stories from the scriptures, precisely why we long to receive the healing presence of Christ in sacrament. Tonight we begin a three-day journey through these narrow places, led by the one who showed us it is possible to journey to new beginnings even when the pain seems too great or the terrain too uneven. We are led deep into the paschal mystery of Jesus, whose passion, death, and resurrection make the journey not only possible, but necessary. And in the journey, we will need to leave behind our need to be in charge, our need to be safe, so that we can follow where Christ leads us to new beginnings. And so we listen, and so we gather, and so we pray. We are confident that God hears our every prayer as we pray for one another and for the needs of the entire church. For the church, that we may love one another as Christ has loved us, forgive our enemies, and affirm the dignity of each person, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For those who have nothing to eat, who are being persecuted, or feel abandoned this night, that God will fill their emptiness, renew their spirit, and grant them peace of mind and heart. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For a transformation of society, that God will touch the hearts of many and guide them in bringing the truth of the gospel into their families, their workplaces, and their civic communities. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the sick, for those approaching death, and for those with mental illness, that God will send an angel to comfort and strengthen them. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all who are facing critical and difficult decisions this night, that God will light a path for them, give them strength, and help them to trust in God's unconditional love for them. Let us pray to the Lord. O oh God, you have called us to yourself through the witness of Jesus, your Son. Hear our prayers. We might celebrate these holy days with grace and fidelity. We ask this through Christ our Lord.
Pray now, my friends, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. Grant us, O Lord, we pray, that we may participate worthily in these mysteries. For whenever the memorial of this sacrifice is celebrated, the work of our redemption is accomplished through Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks. Lord, Holy Father, almighty and eternal God, through Christ our Lord. For he is the true and eternal priest who instituted the pattern of an everlasting sacrifice was the first to offer himself as the saving victim, commanding us to make this offering as his memorial. As we eat his flesh that was sacrificed for us, we are made strong. And as we drink his blood that was poured out for us, we are washed clean. And so with angels and archangels, with thrones and dominions, and with all the hosts and powers of heaven, we sing the hymn of your glory as without end we acclaim. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. You are indeed holy, O Lord, and all you have created rightly gives you praise. For through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and working of the Holy Spirit, you give life to all things and make them holy, and you never cease to gather a people to yourself, so that from the rising of the sun to its setting, a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name. Therefore, O Lord, we humbly implore you, by the same Spirit, graciously make holy these gifts we have brought to you for consecration, that they may become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. For on the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice and giving you thanks. He said the blessing and gave the chalice to his disciples saying, take this all of you and drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The Mystery of Faith. Save us, Savior of the world, for by your cross and resurrection you have set us free. Therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the saving passion of your Son, his wondrous resurrection and ascension into heaven. And as we look forward to his second coming, 
we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look, we pray upon the oblation of your church and recognizing the sacrificial victim by whose death you will to reconcile us to yourself. Grant that we who are nourished by the body and blood of your son and filled with his Holy Spirit may become one body, one spirit in Christ. May he make of us an eternal offering to you so that we may obtain an inheritance with your elect, especially with the most blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with your blessed apostles and glorious martyrs, and with all the saints on whose constant intercession in your presence we rely for unfailing help. May this sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth with your servant Francis, our Pope, George Leo, our Bishop, the order of bishops, all the clergy, and the entire people you have gained for your own. Listen graciously to the prayers of this family whom you have summoned before you. In your compassion, O merciful Father, gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world. To our departed brothers and sisters, and to all who were pleasing to you at their passing from this life, give kind admittance to your kingdom. There, we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory through Christ our Lord, through whom we bestow on the world all that is good. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen, amen, amen. At our Savior's command and formed by divine teaching, we dare to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray from every evil graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, peace I leave you, my peace I give you, look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you. Agnus Dei, Agnus Dei, Quitonis peccata mundi, Misera, Stay, quit all this.
Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. Let us pray. Grant, Almighty God, that just as we are renewed by the supper of your Son in this present age, so we may enjoy his banquet for all eternity, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Please kneel as you are able.
our Savior's glorious body, which his virgin mother bore. Hail the blood which shed for sinners, did a broken world restore. Hail the sacrament most holy, flesh and blood of Christ adore. Pange lingua gloriosi, corporis misterium, sanguinis capreziosi, quam in mundi preziosi, Jesus ventris generosi, rex effudic gentium. To the Virgin for our healing, His own Son the Father sends, from the Father's love proceeding. So our seed and word descends, wondrous life of word incarnate, with this greatest wonder ends. to mergo sacramentum banaramur cernui et antiquum doctumentum novos et ad fritui prestet vite supplementum Sensum perfectui. Genitori, genitoca, laus et jubilatio, salus honor virtus quoque, sit et benedictio, Sweet love. 